Yeah? All right, everybody, come in, take a seat. Come on, this is the best part of the entire event right here. So get a seat. We're going to make so much noise and have so much fun that anybody that's left out there is wondering why on earth they didn't come in earlier, okay? So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, it's hard to believe that another Jam Beyond is kind of coming to a close, right? I know, it's, it's emotionally, it's just, it's just devastating. The worst thing ever, because we have had three days of incredible presentations. In fact, I know I said something similar last year, uh, but you know what? This really was, because I saw from other people that reached out to me, that posted online, that they learned things at this event that they had never experienced before. And they had knowledge given to them and friendships made that they had never experienced before. So I think in that sense, we can very easily say this is the best event ever. If you got something out of this event, can I hear it? <laughs> so we can always take time at the end to thank everybody that's involved, but I would like to take a moment right now as the closing keynote. It's my privilege to be able to thank the people that have gone behind the scenes to make this entire thing possible. So if you've been involved in making this Jam Beyond what it is, would you stand so we can appreciate you? Stand up. So I've been told that Americans typically put everything in the superlative. Everything is always the best, the greatest, or the worst. And the worst day of my life, like, was it literally the worst day of your life? Or this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. So in, in, in order to be more European, I'd like to say that this day and beyond it was pretty good. And other than the fact that it was a maze to get to any room in this entire place, I think I enjoyed myself. <laughs> so I consider it an incredible privilege to be able to deliver the final keynote, to kind of wrap things up, to kind of touch on what we've been able to do over the last three days. Um, and I knew early on what my topic was, um, and focusing of this year's event being on investing. And we kind of have the slogan of investing in our future. But we kind of took that a step further at this Jam Beyond, and we said, not only are we going to invest in our future, but we're going to make it happen. And we did something at this event that we've, I don't think in my memory, ever done before at an event, where we took time to actually make it happen, to do something. And I think that's been absolutely incredible. And I think we've seen a lot of value that's come out of that. And I am going to use superlatives because deep down inside, I am still American. <coughs> so for the closing keynote, we're going to talk a bit about investing. And we're going to invest beyond just today, right? We're going to be taking what we've done here and the things that we've made happen here and we're going to take them with us. And we're going to continue investing. So the topic being your next investment, I want to look quickly at learning from pain. And I know, I know, I'm surprised only one person so far has said this to me. Hey, you spelled pain wrong. I know. <laughs> this pain is a different kind of pain. Because yes, learning can be hard. And yes, getting involved can be painful at times, and, and sometimes change is even painful. But what I'd like to do is kind of look back and learn from history. And in particular, I'd like to look at an important figure in American history, and I think other countries as well, an individual by the name of Thomas Paine. Has anyone heard of Thomas Paine? 
Okay, great. So here's a quick quote just to get us started. Right here. Tis not in numbers, but in unity that our great strength lies. Now, this was a quote that he gave in a publication, Common Sense. We'll talk a bit about that in a second. I could seriously give an entire speech just on this one quote, because I think it so aptly fits the open source mindset that we as a community embrace, and the size of our community, and, and the things that we do. But see, I'm getting off topic. Okay. So here's a quote. We're going to get started. We'll start by looking at some of his early years and kind of where his beginnings were from and how that impacted his life. So Thomas Paine um, was born in England in the 1700s. He wasn't born to a rich family, and they didn't have a lot. In fact, he grew up as working as an apprentice uh, in his father's shop. His father worked as a corset maker, and Thomas apprenticed for him for a good while. His parents decided early on that education was something that they valued. It was something important to them. And so even though education wasn't compulsory at the time, they enrolled Thomas in Thetford uh, Grammar School and gave him the opportunity to, to learn, to, to go to school and to get an education. I think that's a little bit of a side interesting point because really what they were doing was they were investing in him. So let's see, actually, if that investment pays off for them as we look at some of his life. So he began working at an early age. Um, as I said, he apprenticed with his father in a corset shop. But he has an incredibly diverse work experience, and it was really fascinating reading about him because you know, instantly you hear a certain occupation and you think a certain thing about someone. Um, but Thomas, Thomas was a little bit different because he went from being a corset maker to being a legalized pirate. That's pretty cool, right? He was a privateer um, and was out that was commissioned to see ships. That's a pretty drastic opposite there. Um, he wasn't a pirate for long, and eventually he returned to England and he set up his own small business um, as a corset maker. Along the way, he had many other experiences that he was involved in. So instead of just focusing on, on that one business, he began to get involved in other things as well. Um, he worked as a goods inspector. So he was involved in government early on. Eventually, he became a school teacher. So he's had a very, very diverse work experience and a very different background. Um, he held a lot of different positions and had a lot of business experiences along the way. And he was very much a small business type of person. It's easy to see when you look back on things, you can kind of see how they start to relate. And he had a lot of different experiences, but you can kind of start to see a common thread here, where he was involved in politics early on, he was involved in government processes, um, and he was involved in, in business and in, in making things come together and to grow. Um, during this time, he also married, and unfortunately, sadly, lost both wife and child uh, during childbirth. So if you have families, I'm sure you can relate to the immense heartache that that would cause and just the emotional impact it would have on you. But it didn't stop just with his personal life because he experienced setbacks and hardships and failures in his businesses as well. Several of the jobs he lost, he had enemies that came forward and would slander him to get him removed from positions. His businesses had gone bankrupt. He was fired from several of the government jobs. So that kind of puts perspective on this next quote a bit more. The real man smiles in trouble, gathers strength from distress, and grows brave by reflection. If we look forward in his life, and we will kind of go through it a little more in order, but if we were just to skip to the end, uh, we'd see that he experiences even more hardships and more trials. In fact, when he died, there were only six people that showed up at his funeral, which is interesting because now if we look back on him, we credit him with so many incredibly important things. 
So let's look for a second at some of his influences, and then we'll look at some of his most well-known works. He was influenced by a number of powerful people, and three of those would be Voltaire, Benjamin Franklin, and John Locke. How many of you are familiar with all three of those? Excellent. So I'm going to read just a little snippet for each of them to give you some perspective. Voltaire was a writer. Um, he produced works in just about every literary form, plays, poems, novels, essays. He wrote more than 20,000 letters and 2,000 books. He was a very outspoken advocate, even when there was risk to him being imprisoned as a result of it. So that's Voltaire. Next was Benjamin Franklin. Most, probably the most common of the three. Benjamin Franklin was um, an author as well, but he was an inventor, a scientist, a politician. He was involved in very, very many different areas. Um, he was foundational in defining some of American ethics and relating, relating work ethic and values and placing those in a governmental setting. Um, he, he really pushed the movement um, for that Enlightenment period. And then lastly, John Locke. And John Locke was an English philosopher and physician and one of the most influential of the Enlightenment thinkers. He was known as the father of classical liberalism. So we've got three very, very different and yet similar people that are influencing Thomas Paine. So we've seen each of these men. Let's look at how they influenced the writings and the works created by Thomas Paine. He's best known for two works, and we'll look at both of them. The first is Common Sense. It was a pamphlet which he published, and when he published it, he had no idea the impact that it would have. It immediately took off, and over 100,000 copies sold within three months. That's like top of the Amazon bestseller list. It didn't so much reveal new ideas, but what he did was he took these complex thoughts and, and political discussions and debates going on, and he turned them into something that everybody could understand. He made it simple. And as a result, it grew to become his first well-known public work, and it was the best-selling American title of the period. The second one was published shortly after, uh, within the same year. It was called The American Crisis. And it was a pamphlet series, and it was designed to inspire Americans during, during their battle in the past uh, when they were going through uh, the separations. Um, it was done much more um, of a dramatic fashion, moving statements and quotes and things to really inspire people, right? And, and this, this work was a different, different focus than his previous work, and this work was more about instilling that sense in people to get up and to do something. So I'd like to draw a particular quote from this second pamphlet as the theme for my talk and as the theme for what we're looking at here. And I can tell you a little bit of a story about how I came to hear this quote, um, but here we go. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. That's a pretty powerful statement. I heard that quote first when I went to my daughter's recital at school. I have three kids, by the way, um, and a wife, one wife. <laughs> so far, that's right. I, I, I'll stick with one. She is a saint. I give that in every speech that I give so that when she sees the tape, she realizes that I have embarrassed her thoroughly in front of all sorts of people because she volunteers to stay home and keep our kids so that I can come out and do this. So we went to this recital for my daughters, um, and this was one of the quotes that they gave during the recital, and I thought it was incredibly powerful, and I thought of that it held so much in it. And I think that it holds a lot for us. But really, that's not what you're here for, right? Is this what you're here for? So 
So let's talk about Jumon. I mean, that's what we love, right? Oh, that was weak. That was so weak. That was horrible. All right, that, that was your... Okay, everyone pretend for the next 10 seconds that you're an American. We're all here because we love Joomla, right? (laughs) Awesome. Yes, yes, this is why we're here, because we love Joomla. So let's actually, let's actually dissect a bit about why we're here and what we love, and let's see if we can relate it a bit. So we're working together, right? We're coming together as a whole. We've formed a community, and we're a family, in essence, around a set of goals and ideals and a common vision. If we take a second, we can go back and review a brief timeline of what we've been able to accomplish so far to date. We started out, brand new product. In 2008, we released Joomla 1.5. Again, revolutionary. We set the ground that everyone else wanted to copy. We were it. And then we kept going. We didn't stop there. In 2011, we released 2.5. And then in 2013, we accomplished Joomla 3.2. We've significantly improved with each one. And we've added value to our CMS at each point. But we have a long and storied history. We go back a long way. In fact, we've kind of set a trend of launching new things, of setting the stage that other people want to follow. And I leave 2014 blank because we still have more to go. And it's going to be incredibly exciting to see where we're heading and the things that we're still able to accomplish. Because I firmly believe we're not going to just stop here. We're going to continue to be the innovators and the leaders and the ones that show everyone else how you do it and how you do it well. So let's put some numbers to it to give it a little bit of an idea. 47,320 days or nights. Probably mostly nights if we're talking about coding. Um, But that's a big number. A little hard to quantify, a little hard to see. We could switch that and we could say 6,760 weeks. Yeah, okay, we're getting to a smaller number. Still, it's not making a whole, whole lot of sense. 1,560 months. All right, I'm getting somewhere. I can think about 1,000. But if I say 1,000 months, now I'm a little bit confused still on how long is that actually going to be, and I don't want to do the math. 130 years. That is the combined work that is estimated to have gone into creating Joomla. If you go to popular sites that outline lines of code versus uh, time spent, and you multiply that out by man hours, and you go through all this complex math, you get to the concept that 130 years. But actually, that doesn't even fully represent what's gone into this product, right? How many of you are coders? Okay. How many of you do something else to contribute to Joomla besides code? Absolutely. So 130 years, that's purely looking at lines of code and the time taken to write. That doesn't even begin to touch the surface of the amount of time that's gone into the Joomla project. So, yeah, that's a lot of time. But is it all about time? And the next question is, is that really just time that's been spent? Is it lost? I don't think so. I think it's time that's been invested because we've invested in something that's going to continue going forward. We're not just expending energy and time, we're investing energy and time. And so we've invested time and energy into this community, and as a result, we we kind of hold it pretty close, right? We value it. So then the question is, Has it been obtained too cheap? So what's that mean? I ask a question. Has Joomla been obtained too cheap? Based on the numbers, based on the figures that we've just looked at, understanding the heart and soul of this community, which we've all dedicated tremendous amounts of time to, you were weak in your answer. Have we obtained it too cheaply? 
No, we have not. Absolutely not. There is incredible value found in Joomla. And we hold it in high esteem, right? We regard it with, with a high level of esteem because we believe in our community. And we believe in the purpose of what we're doing and in the visions that we as a family hold. We don't obtain, we don't esteem Jumal lightly because we did not obtain it cheaply. And more than just esteem, we hold it dear to us, like it's a part of us. We love Joomla, and we've believed in Joomla. We've built businesses and lives around Joomla. It holds tremendous value. So, we can all agree, Joomla is valuable. Yes? Okay. Yeah. Can you agree, Joomla is esteemed? Yeah. 130 years of effort. Obviously, we value this. We esteem it highly. Joomla is stable. We've gone on for a significant time period. We've gone on when others have come and gone. We've continued to establish value and grow the value. And we've made a system, a CMS, that millions of people rely on. And we've made it to be stable. We recently said in one of the releases, the most stable release ever. But if we look at it not simply from a stable factor in the sense that the code is stable, but we look at it in the sense that our community is stable. What we're here, what we're doing is stable. We've built it on a solid foundation. So if we agree to all three of those statements, and it matters to you, then the only possible conclusion is that Joomla is a good investment. <coughs> and in today's economy, we're all looking for a good investment. Yeah? We're all looking for something that is worth our time, our energy, our money, that's a good investment. Well, I just showed you Joomla is a good investment. Yeah? <laughs> so, let's relate that to each of us. Where do you spend your time? I don't want you to really tell me because it would get embarrassing for some. <laughs> Here's a short list. TV, internet, sports, family, parties, work, sleep, eating, eating, drinking, holidays. There's a lot of things that we spend our time on. So the question is not which of these do you need to cut out? But necessarily, maybe the better question is, which of these is an investment and which of these is an expense? Which one of these are important to your life and which one are you actually wasting time on? Right? Because I think we could all look at this list and say, you know what, I probably do a little too much of that. Or some of you might say, well, I probably do a little too much of that. If you're wasting your time, wouldn't you rather be investing it in a good investment that's actually going to be worth something? So I challenge you to look at the things you spend your time on, to invest in those things that are important. Family is important. Is this family important? Sure. Thank you. If these are something that's important to you, you will find ways to invest. I've given tons of talks at tons of different places. And one of, the peop one of the topics that always comes up is, can you talk about ways to get involved? How many of you have heard a talk from me or someone else about ways to get involved in Joomla? All right. So is there any point in me giving you yet another talk about the number of ways you can get involved in Joomla? No. You know you know what they are. And if you don't know, I'm more than happy to tell you, but I'm not going to do it up here. There are plenty of ways to get involved. So if you know how to get involved, then I guess the real question is, if you haven't gotten involved, why not? And if the reason you haven't gotten involved is because you haven't yet placed the value in Joomla, then that's why this talk is important. 
So I'll leave you with the quote one more time. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. If you esteem Jumla highly, if you hold it dear, then Joomla is your next investment.